Hello and welcome everyone in another episode of Researcher Celebrity. Today, I am a bit nervous because the Researcher Celebrity we are going to have this conversation is one of my personal favorites. Although I always try to keep these things out of the conversation, but uh, to all the audience, please forgive me because today it will I, I will not be able to do that. For Researcher Celebrity today, we have Professor Janet Hemingway a little brief I can tell, uh, tell her about is she has done her bachelor's in genetics from University of Sheffield and then did PhD in London School of Tropical, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and currently is director at ICON and also a professor of tropical medicine at LSTM and 100 other jobs, which we'll be discussing now. With this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Professor Janet at the platform. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we always start our conversation with that how and when you decided that you wanted to become a researcher. I guess I decided uh, about 13 um, that I wanted to work with animals. Um, like many kids, um, I thought maybe I would be a vet. Um, I used to have horses and dogs and cats and frogs and newts and snakes and goodness knows what as a, a child. Um, and then um, I really got interested in genetics um, as um, an A-level student. Uh, and you've got to remember, this is many, many years ago. So it was really just um, in its infancy, not quite at Mendel's level, um, but population genetics and some of the other activities were really coming into their own at that point. Um, and so I really thought this is a great um, subject. Um, it's very logical to me and something that I'd like to, to look at more. So I started to look at what universities there were in the UK that offered genetics degrees, um, and there were only three of them. Um, and so I applied to those um, and was actually rejected. Um, they said, no, you haven't got the right A-levels to, to come in and do a genetics degree because um, it's so specialised. But Sheffield actually had a, a common first year degree where anybody doing any biological subject um, all did the same courses in the first year. And then you could change your subject specialism in your second year. Um, and so I went to Sheffield, registered for zoology, um, quite enjoyed the zoology as well. So in fact, I ended up doing um, two degrees in one. So I majored in genetics, but also carried through the zoology. So I've got degrees in both, um, which is fairly unusual. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will say that for you, I think there is no word called unusual because what you have done. So let's start this uh, conversation from sweeping the floors, okay? being doing all the janitorial work because you established the first mosquito insect in the university mm -hmm. now sweeping the world with more than 200 pounds million research grants this journey we will try to keep in one hour which is a task for me but how would you like to start that after your bachelor's when people believe that a not everyone should be given opportunity to do research only you know specialized people as you mentioned even for degree admission it is you have to have super a grades or whatnot then you did your bachelor's and you made up your mind that you want to do a phd at that mm -hmm. time when not many people in general especially the girls now the women in stem we start talking about women in stem when yep. you decided that you wanted to do a PhD. What were the challenges at that age? I, I guess I didn't come from an academic background at all in terms of a family. And so I didn't have anybody to map out that career track for me. Um, I had to, to sort of work it out for myself as, as I um, went through. But because I decided when I went and did my degree, somebody came and gave a talk in the second year um, that I was at university and they gave a talk about mosquitoes and malaria. At that point, everybody, when they'd started trying to work on molecular biology, was working on Drosophila because it was the easy insect to work on. 
Um, and like everybody else, I was following what my tutors at Sheffield were telling me to do. And I was about to embark on a project on Drosophila. This person came and gave a talk on mosquitoes. And I thought, why am I going to work on Drosophila? Why don't I work on mosquitoes? Um, so I went to see my tutors and they said, well, you can't work on mosquitoes. We don't keep them here. So I said, well, why is that a problem? Why can't I bring them in? Um, and they said, well, that's up to you. It's it's a risk. But um, if you want to take that risk, then um, you can do that. And um, so I, I then contacted the three or four people who were in, in the UK who were working on mosquitoes, one in Manchester, two in, in London, um, and said, can you supply with me with mosquitoes and teach me how to to um, culture mosquitoes and and keep them because I had no idea how to do that. Um, so I got to know everybody very quickly in the UK that was working on mosquitoes and then started to talk to them about, OK, well, how had their careers developed? And so it became very obvious to me that if I really wanted to carry on in this field, I was going to have to do a PhD. Um, and so um, at the end of, of my um, degree, I was actually incredibly lucky. All three of the people who I would contacted to get the mosquitoes had kept in contact with me. And all three of them offered me PhD positions. Um, and I just happened to, to take the first one who rang the day my degree results came out. So um, I was um, really very naive at that point. It was the first time I'd ever been to London. So I'd never been on an aeroplane before then. Um, I um, was thinking about this, this career in front of me, but I had no real plan in terms of exactly where it was going to take me. I just knew it was really interesting as far as I was concerned. And clearly, if other people had managed to get a career in this area, then, well, OK, why couldn't I? Um, and so it, it was worth me doing that. And, and I was going to have a good fun time. Um, just as a slight side conversation, my grandfather was a minor. Um, and we, as I say, we weren't academic at all as a family. And so I was obviously going to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to do my PhD. And so my grandfather turned around and said to me, you've just finished university. Why are you going back to school? <laughs> when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> so I tried to sort of explain to him, well, this it wasn't quite a job. I was still going to be a student um, and I was going to learn a lot about mosquitoes. And then he said, mosquitoes, what sort of career are you going to get working on mosquitoes? You know. You should get a proper job. <laughs> Unfortunately, he died many years ago, so he never quite saw the proper jobs I did get at the end. But it was completely beyond his understanding, and I think the rest of my family's, in terms of the kind of career I was embarking on. Um, but I guess don't let anybody ever tell you no. And, and I guess that's one of the things um, I learned very early on in life, and uh, it stood me in good stead. So... For coming from a family background where nobody knows about academics, okay? And then this is uh, some of the questions which I believe in current stage of research, most of the researchers get the same question asked by their parents when you are going to get a real job. Mm -hmm. Because for them, PhDs, <laughs> postdocs, and then all the research, until unless you are faculty somewhere, for them, it is not a job. So we'll talk about this, but now I wanted to ask about so you mentioned that you had no idea how to culture mosquitoes, but you wanted to do a PhD in mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that idea, if someone in current situation, the researchers who want, who are so passionate about doing something without knowing anything, how should they approach the, you know, next step? Yeah. So I've always found that if you've got a lot of enthusiasm for what you're wanting to do, and you can show that you've thought about it. If you then approach somebody who you know knows a lot more than you do about that subject and ask them for help and just ask them in the right way, usually they're delighted to help. And so I've always had lots and lots of people at different stages in my career who've helped me. And what I try and do is instill then in, in the people who work with me uh, and for me, their job is to help others as well. 
Um, and so if we all get into that mindset of, of helping each other, it helps everybody grow. You take those enthusiastic young people and you nurture them and you help them along that pathway. Um, they need to put a lot of time and energy in themselves because normally you're approaching far more senior people. But if you find people who really do have that enthusiasm, you'd be surprised how much help you will get from senior people. And I guess one thing I also learned quite early on is don't be afraid to approach senior people. Um, you might think, oh, they won't have time for me. And, you know, they can't possibly, you know, take time out to, to, for me. But if you approach them in the right way and you're asking them for something specific that it's easy for them to say yes or no to, you'd be surprised how many times people will say yes. But now this brings us to the approach a person should uh, take. I'm 100% sure that you get emails every single day and your outbox is like, you know, bursting every day from the emails when people write to you either for asking a general question about the research field or about the position in your lab or about the guidance, then what are the things which actually make you open some of those emails, if not all? Okay, so, so I always open the emails. Um, I don't always respond to them, um, but I will respond to most of them. Some of the things people will ask me and I'm thinking, all you need to go is go and read a paper on that and you will know the answer. So um, I will just point them in the direction of where they can find the information. It isn't my job to distill it for people. Um, and uh, they're almost being lazy in some ways if they, they ask me in, in the wrong format. Mm -hmm. So with those, you point them in the direction of where they can find the information. Okay. Um, where I often get uh, pulled in is when people ask me for career advice or, um, as you say, have we got um, jobs in the lab or things like yeah. that? We can't um, obviously accommodate everybody, um, mm -hmm. but very often if I know somebody's in the market, I will say, you know, we don't have anything yet, but have you tried, uh, you know, somebody else in terms of a different uh, uh, name or lab or something like that? So you just try and be helpful where you can. Um, and normally um, from the more junior person, they're not just approaching one person. They'll often be approaching several people. So hopefully they will get something back by um, sending their net out. But being um, concise about what it is that they want and making sure that they're really targeting the right people. So lots of generic emails where somebody's just finished a degree and, you know, um, they're, they're wanting a job broadly in this area. I get too many who are far more specific and really want to come and work with me to actually really respond and help those who are just putting out a generic email to, to see what they can find. Mm -hmm. So now when we do talk about this, that don't be afraid to approach the senior people and you're one of those senior most, I know. So in, uh, you know, in UK and you have traveled the world, the current situation, which I, on based on my personal experiences, which I have seen, the students are becoming more vigilant and more uh, informed about when they should approach when they are approaching a professor or you know emeritus for their guidance. They know how to do this, but mm -hmm. when it comes to do with the early faculties who want to establish their collaborations with you know experts in the field. How should they behave, uh, like, you know, uh, write or approach in a different way so that they can get what they would really want to do? So I, I think there it's also working out what it is, if you're a, a young faculty member, what is it that you are wanting to learn? What is it that you don't know how to do that if you did know how to do it, um, you could move your own research agenda forward? And so... That's, again, the way I've kind of approached it. I gave you almost that early example of I didn't know how to culture mosquitoes, but I found people who did. After that, I didn't need anybody to help me show, to show me how to culture mosquitoes. But when I started doing molecular biology, I did need people to teach me a whole range of different techniques and, and things like that. So um, I would then think about, OK, whose lab could I go and visit to learn specific techniques and things like that? Um, where could I go to to actually 
increase the breadth of my knowledge or as I was starting to set my own research group up, who could I bring in to my research team who was going to have a, a different set of skills to my skills to be able to expand the skill set of the research team itself to start and take things forward. So I think it's always thinking about what is it that you're trying to do? Um, you can't learn everything and be good at everything. But um, if you've got a good idea of, of the direction that you're trying to, to go in, then you can start and work out what is it that you need to learn and what's the, the cutting edge and, and state of the art. So I've always really, I guess, been interested in how things work. Um, and that doesn't matter whether it's um, looking at genetics or, or the engine of a car. It's the same thing um, that you um, think about the skill set that you need to really understand what it is that you're looking at. And then when you understand it, you can move on to the next thing. Um, and sometimes you can pull information together from multiple fields and create something that is is brand new and different. So um, I've always been of that mindset and, and I still am. And the day that I stop um, really wanting to learn something new is the time that I really need to retire. So I haven't quite done it yet. Um, I think there's lots of interesting things still coming down the track. Um, and I've now got a bit more time to to do that as well and learn a bit more. So I'm now looking at mobile robotics and AI and machine learning um, and how we can apply that to developing new products in the mm -hmm. fields that I'm really interested in. Um, and um, um, we'll we'll have a big mobile robotics um, AI lab set up next year to be mm -hmm. able to look at the um, drug discovery space in in category three areas um, alongside pushing the, the frontiers of looking at how we do um, clinical trials um, using genetically manipulated TB to be able to help develop new drugs for multi-drug resistant TB. So there's a... Um, a never ending list of questions and um, the questions I narrow down to what it is that I'm interested in taking forward. And then I work out what it is that I need to actually sort of allow me to to answer that in the best format. And that process has stayed with me all my life. Yes. So this brings us to next uh, topic about challenges in research. So people spend their entire life doing a focused research, answering the questions. And with you, it's been like you have touched 100 different fields, excelled in all of them. There is no way that there were not challenges in front of Professor Janet Hemingway just because she is Professor Janet Hemingway. So the challenges you faced, how you overcome that, and now, on the basis of your experience, what you suggest for the researchers in different stages of their career, how they should have. Okay. So, so I think researchers come in different formats and understanding what kind of researcher you are um, quite early on, I think, is, is probably helpful. So some people actually love the detail that they get into with the research and are more than happy to work on um, a project that they will uh, take through in, in evolution over many, many years, but they want to be at the lab bench. They want to be actually hands-on doing the work. Um, they don't want to run a big uh, research group and not everybody could and, and should. So that's one format. And if you sit in that group, then I think there's a, a really good career that you can hive out for yourself for following that track. There are other people who want um, to have a more expansive sort of program and will want to run quite a, a big um, lab or a medium-sized lab. They'll be bringing different people in and they will evolve um, the work that they do over time, but they may stay in the same research area for, for all of their careers, but um, move around within that, that kind of broad research area. And there are a few people like myself, and I, I think I probably am a little bit unusual, that looks at some of the big picture and thinks about some of the big problems that are there. So having started off working on mosquitoes um, and then started uh, looking at resistance to insecticides in mosquitoes, it was then blindingly obvious to me that 
one of the big problems was that um, we weren't getting new public health insecticides developed. And so for several years, I kept saying alongside lots of other people, well, industry should do that. And then I realized why industry was never going to do that. And so I thought, well, why don't I do that and persuade industry to do it with me? Um, and I guess that was my next big step in terms of, of moving out of the lab and out of running quite a big research group into thinking about how did I tackle one of the kind of big problems that was there in that pathway and try and pull together a consortium of different groups, academic, industry, public health, um, normative agencies and others who would need to be able to take that problem uh, and solve it as, as a whole. And having done that, that almost becomes addictive because you realize you can do something big like that. And so I um, created IVCC to develop new public health insecticides. And we were responsible for bringing the um, new formulations of indoor residual spraying that people are now using in, in uh, throughout Africa. We were also responsible for working with industry to get the piperide butoxide um, bed nets developed and actually do the big clinical trials. And now they're the dominant nets that people are using um, in um, malaria control. But um, once I'd set that up and run that for about 10 years, I passed that on for somebody else to, to do. But I thought, OK, I can take that same approach because it doesn't really matter whether I'm talking about a public health insecticide or a drug or a vaccine or a diagnostic. A lot of the problems are the same. And a lot of the ability to solve those problems needs similar solutions. And so that's what I'm doing now. I've moved into an even broader field where um, over the last three years, we've helped um, 36 different products get through to market and 5.6 billion units of those products are now with people. Um, so there's some huge big products there. We brought vaccines through, we brought diagnostics through, um, we've got drugs moving through the pipeline, but we've also got some other personal care products moving through that pipeline with a whole range of different industries. Um, and it just shows you what you can do if you apply what you've learned from those earlier iterations of what you've been doing to similar problems and, and take people with you along that journey. So I think to come back to your question, how do you start down those tracks? I, I think, first of all, decide what the track is you want to be on. And then um, think about, are you a big picture thinker? Are you somebody who likes a kind of medium sized picture or do you want a real concentration of, of getting that satisfaction of really understanding in great depth a, a project? Um, because I no longer do the great depth. I can talk at a surface level um, about a whole raft of different things, but I have lots of teams of people who work underneath that big umbrella who know a great deal more than I do about all of those subject areas. And that's the other skill, uh, finding the good people to work with, um, helping them with their careers um, and helping um, drive the, the whole system forward. So <clears throat> taking the fundamental research from the bench to the translational one where people get all those products. And then one example is like three years, 36 products. People perish their entire life to develop a couple of products and then even after development, pushing them to the market where people, the end users can actually get benefited out of that research. You have done that obviously fantastically. Now talking about this, when you have tasted the fundamental research and now you are just, you know, as you mentioned, take, picking the people who are experts and then making, establishing those collaborations so that the product can benefit for which we are all doing our hard works, either in the lab or on the computers, because nowadays, as you mentioned, artificial intelligence is so much, you know, in integral part of any research. So the challenges when it comes to the fundamental research and when it comes, you have a product ready, but because of some policies, you cannot, you know, pass that boundary. So the challenges in two different stages and how a researcher or a person who works just with the policy part of the research can get over. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I, I think often um, people don't have that map in front of them uh, of how you go from the fundamental research to actually getting a product out to market. Um, and that's one thing I would encourage everybody to do, no matter which bit of that pathway they're working on, to actually have that view of where am I in that pathway and what are the next hurdles that are coming along? Um, because um, they will be there. And then the question is, am I the person to take this through that hurdle or do I pass it on to somebody else? And if I pass it on to somebody else, who do I pass it on to? Um, because otherwise people can get frustrated, exactly as you say, they do their work and then they think, great, this is ready to go. And then you suddenly find there's a regulatory problem or you can't get a WHO recommendation to get something used or um, uh, there, could, there could be a whole raft of different things in, in, uh, as problems that, that come through. If you've actually planned that out and thought about it at an earlier stage, you can start and do something about it. Um, and it may not be your job to take it forward, but at least you know who should you engage at quite an early stage. Don't leave it to the point where it hits that barrier. Um, to start and open those discussions and see whether there's somebody who can take things forward. So a lot of the time um, I will work with individual academics or we work with companies um, and we, we work out that roadmap for them and say, where are they on that roadmap? And often they're not sure. They often think they're much further down that roadmap than they are in terms of product development. So a lot of academics are really at that very early stage and are quite a long way from getting a product through. Um, industry is usually better, but not always. Um, once it gets a, a product to, to medium stage development of being really clear what its route through to market is, uh, because that's the way they survive. Um, but having that um, both rigor and um, clarity on what that pathway is, because uh, as academics, we're all interested in asking lots of interesting questions, but those interesting questions sometimes are not on that pipeline of, of development. And so sometimes they take you off in a different direction. That's fine if you understand that's what you're doing, but don't pretend almost to yourself that what you're really doing is, is developing a product that you're going to get to market if you suddenly divert and, and go down a sideline that is interesting science but it's not on that critical pathway. Um, so I think just thinking about what it is that you're doing, why you're doing it, and and what that route is. And if you need a policy change, who needs to do that policy change? Where does that need to happen? Is that at national level? Is that at international level? Um, and you'd be surprised, no matter which pipeline you look at, you realize there are those problems sitting in there. So, you know, I work with companies who are developing air filtration units um, and they came into um, their own with COVID because everybody was trying to um, remove um, active viral particles out of the air. And then if you get into a UK hospital, they're using HEPA filters in the hospital wards. Well, if you put some air filtration units in there and a, a ward that's got HEPA filters, they work against each other. And so trying to work out what is the optimal standards for these sort of things, and should there be a UK standard, and did that mean you were going to have to change things in hospitals or care homes or in other venues where you wanted to um, put air filtration systems in was interesting. Um, but the net result of that, after a, a year or so of doing work, we've now been asked to put the national guidelines together for filtration systems like that. Um, because there was no national guideline up till then. And now everybody working in that area knows what the standards are that they will need to work at too, and how you might get a product through into market then if you can meet those guidelines. Um, just one example, I could give you many others um, in terms of a, a whole range of different products there. Um, none of which I knew when I started down the path of talking to the companies that were working with the, the units, but they didn't know that either. So we went on that journey together um, and mapped out um, where uh, we needed to, to take these things to be able to, to actually get those companies to a point where they could sell their products into the market. 
So now this brings us to another important topic that when we see researchers in policymaker roles and when a person is in a role who has almost no or very minimal experience of research. Because I'm 100% sure that when you are having conversation with a researcher, it might be sometimes easy and vice versa, sometimes tough to make them understand what you want to say. But with uh, just the policymakers, it is not the same. Mm -hmm. So when a researcher coming from lab, just and because we are having this conversation with you, I will come back to you all the time that starting from not knowing how to culture the mosquitoes and now telling the entire world how to control them. When it is about mosquitoes, everyone knows Professor Janet Hemingway. But when it comes to uh, developing the products like air filter, as you mentioned, just this example, how people give the credentials that, okay, if we are talking to Professor Janet Hemingway, she knows what should be done. Either it is developing the national level policies or, you know, like out of research when it comes to this transition phase, what are the questions or uh, if, if I don't know if challenge is a good word mm -hmm. when you have to interact with them. Okay, so I think a lot of this is communication skills um, and realizing exactly, as you said, when you, you kind of introduce this question, that scientists are good at talking to other scientists. Um, and we all use acronyms and um, to most people who are not familiar with the field, they get lost very quickly in a conversation. And if people get lost in a conversation very quickly, they switch off um, and you don't engage them and you don't take them with you. So I think what you need to learn if you're going to move out of that um, just scientist to scientist communication and start and engage with politicians and policymakers, you need to understand what they want from you. You need then to be able to explain in very plain, very clear English what it is um, that needs to be done. And you need to explain again uh, very clearly why it's a benefit to them to do it. Um, what are they going to gain from working with you? What do we need to change? So um, if you can learn how to communicate that way, you can distill down what is sometimes quite complex science um, and get it to that point of saying, here's the problem we face. How do we solve this problem together? And, and really just... Um, give a, a really clear overview to whoever you're talking to of what the problem is, what their role is you believe in helping solve that problem and how you can work collaboratively to, to take that together and, and do that. And that doesn't matter whether I'm talking about mosquitoes or air filtration systems or genetically manipulated um, insects or TB bark drugs or um, whatever. It's the same skill set that I'm using talking to those different groups of people. Um, it's that ability to see a problem, distill it down to what needs to be done, and then work out how we pull together the people um, together to, to do that. Um, and sometimes this isn't me that needs to do it. A lot of the time it isn't me that needs to do it. I just need to be able to put that problem in front of the policy makers or the regulators or the decision makers, um, do it at the right time, um, and then explain to them why it's important that in their busy schedules, they actually include this in their workflows. So um, we try and, and move things along together. So now this brings us to another very important topic about, you mentioned scientists being communicators. In general, what we have seen and uh, a general public uh, thought also is like, researchers are not very good in communications. Because as you said, they start talking about the jargons and then the people have no idea what you're talking about. So they just shut off and it is not a conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. What are your suggestions and guidance to the researchers that how they should keep uh, any communication very engaging? Yeah, um, I, I guess a couple of things. Some people naturally are good communicators. Um, and if you're lucky and you're one of those who naturally is a good communicator, 
um, you've you've started from a good position. But for those who are not naturally good communicators, there are workshops and things like that, that you can go into that will help you in terms of presentation skills. How do you take those through? So take advantage as you go through your career of the opportunities that you, you're given. And I, I don't know, certainly in the UK, for example, very often you're given um, skills and training on how to interact with the media. Um, because again, that's a good communication skill to learn. And what I then worked out was having gone through some of that process and learned some of those hints and trips, tips from people who are working in the media, I then got to know some of them as friends. And so I can use them as a sounding board now I'm thinking about communicating this. Does this work well? Does that not work well? I recognize people who've got skill sets that are way better than mine in terms of doing that. And if I really want to hone something down, I will actually get them involved before I take that to whoever I need to take it to and say, does this make sense to you? Um, how can I improve it? Um, because you often only get one chance when you're going in front of busy people to actually get that pitch right. Um, and so taking the time, not only to think about it yourself, but put it in front of a, a friendly person who's good at doing that sort of thing is always useful. Um, and again, um, take them out for lunch, um, do it over a, a sandwich or, or something like that, make it a fun sort of bit. Um, but if, if you've got people around you who can help with that, and they're not necessarily scientists that you would do that with. In fact, often they're not, um, because they understand where you start to slip into too much jargon then if, if uh, they're coming at it from that angle. So this is uh, about the startups now, because in a recent trend, we are seeing the PhD graduates, they come up with the idea and then they want to start their own industry. And there are mm -hmm. success stories, obviously, which we all know about, that the uh, PhD students from Professor Doudna's lab started this mammoth and whatnot. All of those, how they should, uh, you know, make sure that when they are going to start or making this translational research from their academic PhD degree to a, a startup, what mm -hmm. are the things they should consider the most to reduce the chances of failure because I don't think that anyone can say that this is 0% and it is 100% safe. If you are yeah. in research, you always have those. So yeah, yeah your suggestion. So, so, so we know that most startups fail. Um, and so why do they fail? Well, I guess thinking first off, is this something you can really build a company around? So you might have a great idea, but is that something that a small company should take forward? Or do you take it to a certain stage within the academic system and then you find an existing company that can take it forward rather than starting something new? So I think go through that process to start with. Then ask the question of yourself, do you really want to take on setting a company up? Because there's a lot of work involved just in the logistics of setting a company up, never mind doing the, the research work that goes with it. Um, so thinking about that, learning about what it is that you need to do to set that company up, registering it, make sure you've got the right taxes, you've got the right incentives coming through um, in terms of grants, things like that, to be able to, to take your idea forward. And then very much thinking about what market is this product intended to um, go into? Um, and is it a, a niche market that a small company can actually take that product through and, and market itself? Or um, are you going to do, be developing something to a certain point and then you'll pass it on to a bigger company? Um, so, for example, an awful lot of the early stage antibiotic discovery is done by small companies. They're never going to do the big clinical trials. They're never going to actually manufacture and distribute and market that. But if they can take something to a phase one clinical trial and show really good results, the chances of them selling it on to a bigger company to be able to have that bigger company take it forward are, are much higher. So understanding what pathway you're getting into. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, and then thinking about um, what 
skill sets of people do you need to bring around you at what stage in your company to take it forward? So as your company grows, you're going to need somebody to look after the finance and the HR and the buildings and the marketing and the communications. Um, when you first set a company up, you don't have the money to do all that. Um, and so you build it uh, over time. So again, I've started up nine companies now. Um, I'm pleased to say they're all trading. Um, the first one I set up 28 years ago. Um, I'm not involved in all of them um, now. So a, a lot of them I've helped start up, I've helped get them going. And then I've, I've either sold them on or passed them on to other people to, to take forward. Um, but Again, it's that skill set of, of learning what you need to do, how you set these things up, and then um, how you get the right people into those companies to make sure that they um, succeed and, and they can carry on growing. Um, but it's not an easy route. So um, often people think being an academic is tough, um, but being in a startup and getting a startup going can be even tougher. <laughs> so now that coming from a person who has nine successful companies running up in then and there. If I have to ask you that, how your PhD has contributed to this part? Um, I don't think it did. Uh, well, no, that's not true. Um, my PhD contributed in as much as I was working on insecticides and, and insecticide resistance. So I started working with people in industry at that point. And I learned quite a lot. They were all people from the big companies. So it was the Sumitomo's and um, Syngenta's, um, BASF buyers of this world. Um, but I learned a lot from them. Sorry, my dog's barking in the background as well. Um, and uh, in fact, the first um, startup I did was then with two of those people from uh, one of those big companies who decided that they wanted to spin out a, a company in a slightly different area. We were in rodenticides and pest control, um, and um, I set that company up with them. Um, so they were bringing a lot of that industrial expertise I had some of the academic expertise. Together, we learned a lot about setting up a, a small company and, and establishing that and establishing manufacturing facilities and uh, a, a whole raft of other things there. So I guess the PhD helped in as much as I met some of the people that I started down that track with. But I didn't learn anything about setting a company up from my PhD. Um, a lot of that was learned serendipitously. Um, these days, there are, again, courses for entrepreneurs, uh, for people who want to, to set up startups, who will take you through that process. Um, but at the end of the day, you almost have to learn by doing, um, because it's it's easy to say on paper, this is what you do in practice. Um, in the, it's, it's quite a hard learning curve. Yeah. So now the second way to ask a different question keeping the just same, that a researcher in you, how helped you to become this giant in insecticide resistance in other fields of product development and others? It's that really, I'm wanting to understand how things work. So that's the research bit. I'm, I'm just curious about the world around me. I'm curious about how things work. And the way you test whether you really understand how something works is you manipulate it and you see whether you get the result that you expect. It's science, basically. And that doesn't matter um, what it is that I'm looking at. It's that exact same approach. So the rigor that I learned from doing science is what I bring to all of those other activities. It doesn't matter whether it's starting up a company or investing in the stock market or looking at developing new technologies in new areas. It's the same skills and the same approach that I'm, I'm taking each and every time. How does it work? Do I really understand how it works? Um, can I demonstrate I understand how it works? How can I move it on to the next level and ask different questions now I understand how it works? Basic playbook for scientists. So now coming to so the struggles we have discussed, now let's touch about the achievements of scientists, the accomplishment, the acknowledgement. So when you get a paper published in a research 
general, you know, be it uh, anyone from science to nature and what not all. That is one sense of accomplishment. But getting an award like which you received, commander of the British Empire, not many of the researchers have ever received it. How these two achievements make you feel? Okay. I guess it's nice to get recognition. Um, and you can feel a butt coming here, but it's not why I do what I do. Um, I do why I do what I do because I get a huge amount of satisfaction from doing it. Um, it gets me out of bed on the morning because I really enjoy what I, I do. Um, I get to meet lots and lots of interesting people from lots and lots of different walks of life. And I get to do something that at the end of the day is going to have a positive impact on humanity. And for me, that's what drives me. And if I happen to get recognition for doing that, I don't go out and seek it. Um, I hope I'm humble in terms of accepting it. But it almost doesn't matter to me. It's it's not, it, it, it isn't why I do what I do in, in any shape or form. Um, so uh, nice to have the recognition, but if I didn't get it, then that wouldn't worry me either. Um, as long as I'm getting that other satisfaction from my career of, of doing something that I really enjoy and I, I'm doing something of, of benefit to, to the people around me as well. So the satisfaction you get from research and all the pushbacks also, because there is no way that you have been into research in industry in all these collaboration for so long and have not got enough pushbacks. Mm -hmm. What make you again stand that, okay, you push me this with this challenge, I'll get over with something else. How do you manage that part? Yeah. So so I always tell people, I, I mean, I've already said you need a, a kind of roadmap of where you are and where you want to get to. Um, and you then need to understand that although you might put your nice little map out as a straight line, um, almost never um, is it a straight line because there will be lots of people who will say no or lots of problems that come along that track. And so it's still keeping that end goal in mind and, and saying, OK, I'm going to get there. I know I'm not going to go there as a straight line. I'll try and do it as a straight line. I'll try and persuade people when they say no to me that they really don't mean no. And if they really mean no, then there's always a means of going around them um, and still getting to where you want to get to. Um, and so... Um, I've always got a plan B if plan A doesn't work, but I'll always try plan A first. Um, and I will never, I never give up. So I, I'm a little bit like a terrier um, that once I've got hold of, of um, somebody's ankle um, and my teeth are dug in, I will not let go. Um, so if I'm going to, to this point, it might take me five years, it might take me 10 years, it might take me 20 years to get there. But that's where I'm going. Um, unless somebody really, really persuades me that I'm wrong um, and I shouldn't go there. And very often that doesn't happen. So um, I've, I'm just trying to think, have, has anybody ever persuaded me I'm wrong and I'm not going there? I can't think of any time they've done that. Lots of people have tried to persuade me I'm wrong, but nobody's ever managed it um, to the point that they've deflected me from any of those big goals. Um, maybe because I, I think I've, thought them through quite hard before I actually decide that's where I'm going. Mm -hmm. um, and so you look at why people are saying no, and often they say no just because they, they think it's too difficult. Um, but difficulty isn't a reason why you shouldn't do something. You know, If everybody took that approach, we would never have put a man on the moon. Um, I mean, some people, I guess, might say we never did, but um, uh, that, that's a whole other area, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But a lot of these things that, that get achieved only get achieved because people do think that they can achieve something big and, and they're going to go there no matter what. Um, and so I, I guess that's that's the other part of it, to, to think about how you're going to, to achieve what you're going to achieve and make sure you do get there. Um, and so I just look at people putting hurdles and problems in the way as part and parcel of that journey um it, it would be a very boring journey if it was very easy so um 
uh, more of a sense of satisfaction when you finally get to your end goal um, that you can do that. So people said I would never get industry to work with me and we'd never get new public health insecticides into the market. Um, I had lots and lots of people saying that in very senior positions, um, and we've got them. They're there. They're coming. Um, so um, it's doable. Um, you just need to work out how you do it and who you do it with. So uh, saying an excerpt from the biography which PNS has published on you, there was one quote in quote, once a rebel, always a rebel. Can we say that for <laughs> Professor Janet Hemingway? I, I think you probably can. Um, so so um, it, it's almost, I think, maybe rebels, maybe the wrong term. Um, it, it's almost if you say no to me, um, what you do is make me more determined to go where I'm going. Uh, mm -hmm. And if that's the way that you actually define a rebel, then, then yes. Um, people telling me I can't do something or I'm not good enough to do something, um, or it's not possible to do something is a little bit like waving a red flag at me. Um, and it doesn't mean I stop. It just means I charge ahead and, and uh, I'm even more determined to get there. <laughs> so starting from the, again, going back to the starting, when people said that you cannot work with mosquitoes, you have said that. And you proved it everywhere starting uh, until now as you mentioned about when people were saying that you cannot establish this industry collaboration, which you excelled with hundreds and thousands of pounds in there, the grants. Now the second stage of this is translating and passing on these skill sets to the new generation of researchers, which you have done a lot as uh, training new researchers in your lab with the collaboration and all. How you see that a person of your repute should, if not clone them, we will be more than fortunate to have more than one Professor Janet Hemingway clones in all the continents and then get this thing going. But if we say that a researcher, a senior uh, emeritus professor, how they should guide or mentor their students so that they can keep the heritage ongoing. Mm hmm so so I hope a lot of the way that you do the mentoring is by people seeing what you do and how you do it, mm -hmm. uh, and then they can copy what you do. Um, so I've got a lot of people who work with me for a very long time. I mean, the, the people still in my lab who first started working with me have worked with me now for getting on for 40 years. Um, so I've got two or three people there who've, who've worked with me for that time period and have moved in, in multiple times with their families uh, as they've gone through. So um, they've seen a lot of, of what gets developed in that program. But often it's the people who come in, work for a short while, and then go out and say, right, I now understand how you do that. And I can set up my own things. I can take my own things forward. And so what I like to think I've been able to do is seed um, a number of different things in different places where I haven't developed them. But what I've done is help the people who have developed them gain the skills so that they could successfully take those forward. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, people like Charles Wanji, for example, who came and, and joined me as a postdoc, um, set up his own institute back in Cameroon. It's now going really well. He's doing some great work. He's the first African um, Wellcome Trust senior professorial fellow, um, still does some work with me. But he learned a lot by actually seeing how I did things and how uh, things got taken forward. Um, and just um, by, um, by thinking about those next stages in his career and knowing that he could always use me as a sounding board, um, I could point to three or four people like that who've really evolved their careers, but uh, just at different points in those careers, come back to me and said, I'm thinking about doing this. If this was you, how would you do it? And it doesn't mean to say they take the advice, um, but at least they will ask for the advice. Um, and you, you give as good advice as you can um, and hope that you can help people on their way that way. So it's that almost informal mentorship that I think works quite well. Um, formally in terms of PhD students, yes, but um, often people need that mentorship at different stages in their career yes. as they go through um, and just think about 
how, who do I know who I can get good advice from? I know it'll be confidential. I know I can say whatever I like to them. And I like to think that I've got quite a, a reasonable network of people all around the world who, who would be able to pick up the phone or drop me an email or come in and see me and, and talk to me about, you know, where they're trying to get to and, and how they're trying to, to do that. So now and hopefully uh, others work that way as well. I'm sure many others do. Yes. So this is uh, now about uh, the conversation and uh... We are walking towards the edge of the conversation. I want to know your thoughts about researchers being celebrities. <laughs> um, I, I think it's good um, as long as um, they're celebrities for the right reasons. So um, okay. you want to be you don't want to be notorious. So bad mm -hmm. science is bad science. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't want that either celebrating or, or people who can't actually do that. But we, do, we talked about communication early on, and I think we yeah. really do need good scientific communicators and people who are really good at doing that and can present more broadly and engage the general public um, do us all a great service because what they're doing is engaging, hopefully, the younger children and having them thinking about this is something I want to do. Um, engaging the general population so that they understand that why this is important and and um that there is a benefit to the whole of society from from what we're doing so those really good communicators i think are, are great and clearly you need some of those who are celebrities in their own right because they get to reach audiences that it, you or i could never do um and so um, having those people around uh, as long as they're they're good at doing what they're doing, um, I think is great. I can think of one or two who are more notorious than beneficial communicators, um, and that's not good um, when you get bad science per perpetuated around the system. But um, uh, you can't stop it completely. Um, you just um, have to try and support those who are, who do the the communication well and do good communication. So now and the last question for this conversation with you will be the word of wisdom to the researchers in the field. The world of? The word like of wisdom. Question, sorry? The word, oh, a of, word wisdom. of wisdom. Oh, heavens. Yes. Um, and enjoy what you're doing. Um, so uh, if I really didn't enjoy what I was doing um, and I didn't get out of bed thinking, I really want to get back in and, and do more science and think about what I'm doing, I would be in the wrong career. So um, make sure you enjoy what you're doing. Um, not all bits of science are the same. And so pick something in terms of the topic and what you're doing that you really enjoy and work out where you can make that difference, but really get that satisfaction out of it yourself as well. Um, because that career satisfaction for you is a big driver um, and um, it will get you a long way if you really are sort of engaged you will be able to engage others nice so with this i will just say to all the audience that stay passionate do whatever it takes to be satisfactory about your work get your satisfaction let the research drive you and with this, on behalf of the entire research community, I'll say thank you, Professor Janet, for taking time out and guiding the people who you have done already all around the globe. I assume that this conversation will help all the people who does not are privileged enough like me to have a connection or a contact with you. Thank you very, very much. It's been my pleasure.